Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. It's getting hot. We're going to talk about how to keep your lawn happy all summer. Also, ants can bug you at a picnic, but fire ants can ruin your day. We're going to talk about how to control them. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Booker T. Lee. Glad to be here. Booker's extension agent right here in Shelby County. And Mr. D is with us. Hello. Thanks for joining me, fellas. Glad yeah, to be glad to be here. It's this is going to be fun. It is good. I'll wait. All right, Booker. We have our lawn care guy with Good us lawn today, care. Mr. D. <laughs> so we're going to talk about good old summer lawn care. And Booker, we have a couple of questions for okay. you. So number one, which is a common question, what is the most common diseases in lawns right now? This time of the year, we see a lot of disease in our, in our lawn. This time, number one, probably brown patch. We see a lot of brown patch on our lawn. It's called by hot and humid weather. Okay. And we don't have some hot and humid <laughs> weather. Yeah. Too much, and also, you can give it too much nitrogen fertilizer. Okay. So you want to hold back on your nitrogen fertilizer when you see brown patch. And also, compact soil. Mm. Aerate that soil. And I did that to my soil last year, and that made a big difference in the lung disease. Because okay. I did have a brown patch. Okay. And I know you spring dead spot. Cutting your grass too short. Now, okay. this time you start cutting that grass, you don't want to cut it too, too short. Most lawn grass needs to be two to three inches tall. Okay. Mm -hmm. And also, Disease on your lawn, bag that grass. Sometimes the little tipping on the lawn, but now when you got disease, bag that grass. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, because you don't want that to spray it, right? Right. And okay. that's powder mildew. You see a lot of powder mildew where the grass stay wet a long time, poor air circulation. You see that grass begin to turn white. That's called powder mildew. Most in cool, on your cool season grass, you'll see that a lot okay. of time. And also, again, avoid high nitrogen fertilizer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And grass under trees can cause that too. Water early in the morning time. Right. Let that grass dry off before nighttime. Okay. Another thing is farrowing. Hmm. And that's come when you have a lot of dead stump or something in your, in your lawn and it be getting ready to uh, rot out. Okay. That can cause that uh, farrowing. And you see a lot of time after rain where the little mushroom in your soil start mm -hmm. popping up. I've seen that. I see it in my. In, I had that, Chris. Okay. <laughs> you will admit that? I, I, admit that. I had a tree in my, in my lawn and had it removed. Okay. And every time it rained, you see those mushrooms come up. It's not hurting anything, just there. They'll go away. Once everything rot and decay, you'll see it go away. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then you know, say a dollar spot. And dollar spot is called by poor drainage. We do have a lot of soil that drain poorly now. If water stand after the rain, you're probably going to start seeing dollar spot begin to pop up. Okay. Check the soil pH. You want this soil pH between 6.0 and 6.5. Right. And the only way you can do that is by what a soil test. Soil you cannot test. go out there and guess that it, and also cut the grass at the recommended height. Okay. Don't cut it too low. Now, I cut my grass low twice, and then when I do the first cup of cutting, then I let my mow up and keep it at the right height. Okay. And another thing, we need to make sure we water our grass early in the morning time. Get that grass time enough to dry off before nightfall. Two things do that, and a lot of times the disease can be controlled by culture practice. Right. You don't want to, you yeah. don't want to do it and start adding a lot of right. chemical to the, to your lawn, because that's the first thing we do. What can I spray on my lawn and that's get right. rid of it? If you keep just spraying chemicals on there, it's going to come back again next year. But you want to try to find the problem, see what's wrong with the problem, then try to correct the problem, then you'll have a less 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 disease on there. But yeah. high humidity, overwatering. Another thing we get disease on our lung is we cutting our grass with a dull mow blade. Mm -hmm. We need to have that mow blade sharp. Sharpen that mow blade. Keep that blade sharp in there. I sharpen mine at least two or three times during the growing season right. to make sure that I have a, a good sharp cut. Another thing is cut your grass in different directions. You need to try to go a different direction and, know, and, keep it, and, and, and make that grass stand up. Okay. Because when you're going the same way, you're laying that grass down. Right. I had a lady call me up there one time and said, my grass is turning brown all the time when I just cut it. And I said, let me go look at that. I said, what you had your lawnmower blade shot? She said, I never have. <laughs> she, it, it just, it just, it'll beat it down. Yeah, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't it cutting it down. Yeah, no clean cut. Right? No clean cut. <laughs> now, if you're going to aerate your lawn, you got warm season grass or you got a cool season grass, you aerate it 
when the grass begin to come out and grow. Now, you still can do your Bermuda grass right now, but I would try to do it in the evening time now. I don't want that roast exposure to hot weather all, right. all, all, all during the day right quick. I will get the cooling off period at night. Okay. But uh, aerated, you will see a big difference in your lawn thing in there. Okay. And let me ask you this. So can a fungus kill your grass? Is that a possibility? Oh, a period of time it will. No, you, you, you have uh, two or three years because if you're not like spring dead spot, you have it during the, during the, during the year, but during that growing season, it'll go back in there. It'll, it'll cover it up. Okay. But each year it'll get larger and larger. If you don't do something to control that problem, it eventually will kill you, Greg. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, look, there's somebody out there watching, and they're like, okay, Booker, we understand your cultural practices, mm -hmm. but I just want something to kill it. Mm -hmm. So what can they use to actually control some of your lung well, diseases? Well, a lot of things, they, they might want to know what disease they have for you. Okay. You know, you've right. got spring dead spot, and you've got a, a brown patch. It's different, it's different fungicide to control that. The best thing to do is check on your hardware stores and see what, tell them, know what disease you have. If you don't know, you can bring by our office. Uh -huh. We'll look at it for you and tell you. Then you can go by the hardware store and get your fungicide to control that disease on there. But that's the most important thing, but uh, know what disease you have because different control for different diseases. Okay, sure. And, uh, and, so, and a lot of people want to know, will it affect my booty grass? Will it affect my zoysia grass? Fungus can most affect a lot of grass. Okay. Yeah, you, you will see it on there. Okay. Um, so why do I have moss on my lawn? Yeah, that's a common yeah. question. People like moss. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I like moss. No, I don't have yeah. moss, but I, I seen a lady with just a lot of moss on her bread, and she she watered her moss till like she take her grass in, in a shade. <laughs> a lot of times when you have moss on your on your lawn, it's really you have a compact soil, could have poor drainage, and it normally it's in shade. You see a lot of time in shade. It normally when water kind of stand when it rains. You know, you mm -hmm. you don't drain fast. It kind of stay there, and then it also you see that moss begin to grow in there. But if in a notion in a shaded location. And then in, 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 on a shade tree. Okay. It's probably got poor drainage. And the poor drainage is really, really big on that. Okay. You know, moss. But moss look, look really good. Uh, it looks nice. Like, some some people say just let the moss take over and just grow where it grows and don't try to control mm -hmm. it. There. But you need to aerate it, check the soil pH. Sometimes it's be like the acid soil. You need to, to check the soil pH. You might need to raise the soil pH some. Right. Mm -hmm. And get it in there. Keep that moss from. Yeah, the moss looks good. If you kick the leaves off, uh, Diane Marucci's <laughs> uh, place uh, has nice moss there. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of people like it. Oh, yeah, we went to in Alabama, and this lady, this is all she had in her backyard, just moss, and she had a sprinkler system on her moss. Right. Watering that moss, keeping it, keep it looking good. Make sure it look good. Make sure huh? it look good. Yeah, so I guess, that, I guess one thing about moss, you won't have no, have no other disease to probably get into it. Yeah, probably so. <laughs> could, no, that could be a problem, having have growing moss in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about winter kill. So I'm sure you got a lot of questions at the office this year about winter kill. Mm -hmm. Why are we seeing so many cases with the winter kill? Wait. Does it specifically have to do with the cold you know, winter do, we have? With the weather. You know, a mm -hmm. lot of times you see a lot of winter kill. Normally, it's where you got a, a, a low area in your yard. Okay. And then when it rains, it uh, gets cold, that water kind of stay there alone, a period of time longer. Because I see that I had one kid, and the way my house faced it, I had a, everybody else, snow and ice were gone. Right. I had mine for about two or three days on there still. Okay. So that's why they stay on there a little period of time. You would see that one kid begin to happen in there. So the best thing to do for one kid, when, once the grass starts coming out real good, get you a wreck and wreck all that dead grass out of there and clean, just clean it up real good. Then the moody grass will come back and spread over there. Okay. A zoysia grass takes some time to, to go over there. If you've got a big spot in your zoysia grass, you might have to resize the sun. Okay. And, and real quickly, Booker, uh, when is a good time to have your soil tested? Well, any time is a good time to have your soil tested. Any time. Any time to have your soil tested and everything in there. But the ideal time is in the fall of the year. Okay. Because you need to add lime to it. You can come in and add lime to it uh, during that time. And by the time your grass begins to start needing it, it's already there. Now, on your soil pH, now, it's going to take some time before you get a different reading. You know, you put it down, you put it down in this, this fall, you, you might see the same thing for at least about six months, but after then, it's going to start getting to your, get into your, to your reading. But it will help anyway still, though. Yeah, that, and then that lime. And lime is the most important thing on your, on your lawn grasses because it can regulate all the other fertilizer that you put down. Okay. You know, it won't be taken up by the plant. All right, well, there you have it from our mm -hmm. lawn guy, Mr. Mm -hmm. Booker T. Lee. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the information, Booker. Thanks. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Mr. D. Ants and fire ants. We don't want them to ruin our picnics. <laughs> they can do it. They can, they can do it. They can do it quickly. Uh, well, 
you know, fire ants uh, are, are pretty much everywhere in, in our area. I don't know how far north they go. Uh, probably, uh, I live in Lauderdale County and I don't have them up there. Really? Uh, okay. I do not. So uh, I know Tipton and, and every, south of Tipton County, Tennessee, and the central uh -huh. part of West Tennessee pretty much, uh, and south that we've got them. But, uh, Still, we, the old standby method on fire ant control is using the Texas two-step. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that's simply uh, putting a, a bait out. And, and meet, make sure, don't, if you've got a bait left over from last year, you need to check and make sure that the ants will feed on that bait. And the way to do that is just put some of it down beside a uh, fire ant mound and sit there and watch it and see if they the, the, okay. they'll go out and start feeding on it. Uh, because most of the baits, the base is a milk base or, or some kind of uh, oil base or something like that, and it can go bad, it can get rancid, and it might get to the point where it doesn't uh, attract the fire ants. So okay. the baits need sense. to be fresh enough that they will attract the fire ants. And you need to put the bait out when the ants are actively foraging. So, you know, in the afternoon and, and you know, there's no need, to, no need to put it out right before sundown because they're mm -hmm. not going to be actively foraging, you know, at night. Um, how about how far from the mound do you put the bait down? That's usually the question that we get. Uh, I wouldn't put it, I definitely wouldn't put it on the mound. Okay. Those entrance and exit holes on the, for, for the fire ants are out two or three feet away from the mound. So, you know, if you've got a lot of fire ants, I just broadcast it. Hmm. Just hmm. scatter it around your yard. They're going to go to it. They're going to find it. And, uh, and what you're hoping that they will do, you know, the fire ant, can't eat that bait. Right. That worker's not going to eat that bait. He has a sieve and he can't swallow solid food. The worker fire, I say he, it's a she. She can't, <laughs> she can't swallow that solid food. So she will take it to uh, a fourth or fifth instar larvae is the only la uh, stage of the fire ant that can eat solid food. That larvae will eat that food and then it will regurgitate it into oh. a pouch, a little pouch turn it into a liquid basically and then the worker fire ants will take that liquid, they will feed off that liquid, they will take that liquid to the queen and and so this is a process that will take eight to ten weeks to kill the queen. Wow. Cool. And, yeah. and, and after that happens then go out there, well, eight to ten weeks to kill the colony because the worker fire ants can live nine or ten weeks. Two or three weeks after you put the bait out put a contact kill, go out there with a contact insecticide and okay. spray. And the reason you're doing that is hopefully within that two or three weeks you've gotten the queen, right. taken the queen out. The workers live, like I said, eight or nine, ten weeks. And uh, if you kill the queen, you'll still have workers running around there for, for weeks. And so do the contact killer after that. So that's the Texas two-step method. And the reason it's called the Texas two-step <laughs> has nothing to do with a dance. Dancing, yeah, <laughs> not dancing. Uh, it was developed by Texas A&M University. Okay. Right. They, de they developed that system. But there are a, a bunch of baits. I've got a list of probably 10 or 15 baits here oh, and uh, these are just, oh, just that are recommended. Uh, and, and then... Uh, on the, uh, the contact killers, there are a lot of contact killers out there that okay. are, uh, have uh, imported fire ants on the label. Okay. Just follow the label Yeah, let's name some of those baits. Okay, the baits, we've got yeah. Extinguish, Distance, Award 2, PT Ascend, Spectricide, Fire Ant Killer, Plus Preventer Bait, uh, Advion Fire Ant Bait, Garden Tech Over and Out, <laughs> wow. Amdro, Amdro Fire Ant right. Bait, uh, mm -hmm. Siesta, <laughs> Extinguish Plus, and then the spinosad baits, such as Fertilome and Southern Ag Payback. Okay. And uh, those are some um, examples of baits that, that are out there that will work. Mm -hmm. And then the contact killers are the ones with the uh, pyrethrins, uh, uh, synthetic pyrethroids, right. uh, several of those that will, bifenthrin and, and, and esphenvalorate and yeah. all of those that will, that will do, the, do the job for you. Make sure they read the label on there too, right? Make sure you read the label. Because you're using the, the contact, right, you're going to pour that right on the mound itself, right? The, okay. the drenches the you drench, do. The right. drenches you, you pour right on the mound. Right on the mound. Yeah. Uh, and that's a good way to do it. You know, mix it in a five-gallon bucket according to the label direction. That way you don't even have to use a sprayer. That's right. You can just drench the mound uh, because the workers always return to the mound. But keep in mind, uh, if you do a real good job of controlling fire ants, uh, when that queen does her mating flight, oh, she looks for an area that doesn't have fire ants. <laughs> Come on, she, doesn't like, yeah. she doesn't like a lot of competition. Yeah. Yeah. And she will land in a 
variant free area and create a new mound. Oh, so it's not man. something that you can do once and think that you're finished with. It's, it's kind of an ongoing deal. Mm. Um, you know you're going to have a picnic in picnic. August? Yep. Booker. <laughs> I'll have one. You know, I'd go out there, you Check know, the start, right start about three or four weeks before that, and, and hopefully you'll be free during that picnic. Because you couldn't, that we seem a lot of time out in the Field Passion Park, and like there were the people mowing, they hit the mound, they kind of spread, kind of spread out. Right. Mm -hmm. Isn't that how you see them in the Field Passion? Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Most of these baits that I mentioned are also good for other ants. Right. They'll take out you other ants that. that are out there. And um, so if you have other ants that are creating problems for you, uh, just I would go with the bait, the baits. To, um, do you, okay. And you don't have to go with the, the, uh, the two-step method on the other ants. <laughs> just the baits will take the, take the colony out. You probably will be doing the take the two-step if you get bitten by some of these ants, I'm yeah, sure, the at some ants, point. They will, yeah, they will make you do it. <laughs> they'll make you do a, a, a jig. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> Let me ask you this, because we get this uh, question a lot. So... You see some fire ant mounds that are real tall and some that are real, you know, low to the ground. Why is that? Well, the purpose of that fire ant mound is to pretty much regulate the temperature and humidity uh. for the brood. And during conditions that are wet and cool, mm. those mounds will usually be higher to try to get the brood or the young larvae out of the real damp conditions. Mm. You're going to see this hot weather and dry weather yeah. that we're having, the mounds are going to almost disappear oh, okay. because they're going deep in order to get the cooler, more moist conditions. How because deep? They, How deep you think? You know, six, <laughs> eight inches, ten inches, you know. You can find them. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. Digging around. You yeah. can find they'll them. find you. Yeah, they'll find. They're not that deep, but, <laughs> but they don't have to have them up above the you know, soil right. line to, to, uh, to keep them dry. Wow. Uh, and, and, and I say keep them dry, but they do require some moisture. So when it gets real dry, they're going down. I mean, they like, they like a little humid, but they don't like it too wet. They don't like it too dry. Kind of like me and you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Oh, so it's humidity. How about humidity. that? Mm -hmm. Smart. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, pretty sharp critters to be so small. And they pack a punch. They might need to go check our park out before we have our picnic. Make sure we, make sure we have the fangs out there. Going see, yeah. they can, out. But you have kids out there playing around. They don't know them. They just might run into them and get into them before you know it. Right. Right. And that's where that's where you see most of the problems when you have people that aren't familiar with mm -hmm. fire ants. I know the first time my daughter found fire ants, mm -hmm. uh, I lived in an area when we didn't have them, and we were in an area that had them, and she's standing on a mound going, what are all these little <laughs> people? <laughs> because yeah. fire ants take a solemn oath when they're small. Baby fire ants take a solemn okay. oath. They will not sting until everybody's ready. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so they'll cover you up and then one they time. Hit you all at Ooh, once. Me right now. Fortunately, we got them off my daughter before they got to right. that point. You know, mm. so so if you don't know what you're doing, you know, you're not used to them. Wow. Then you can get in trouble. But people, you know, a large percent of the population of the U.S. lives in areas that are infested with fire ants, and and or they survive nicely. Wow. So do they have an automatic? Or is it one sting? Or? They've got an automatic. They got They're automatic. not like a hundred. <laughs> they, they can get you. They have an automatic. Bam, bam, bam. Keep stinging. All mm. right. Thanks for the information about those fire ants. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, boy. All right. Here's our Q&A session. Uh, Booker, you jump in there with us. Okay, All right. then. All right. Here's our first viewer email uh, from Miss uh, Teresa. She writes, my purple leaf plum tree bloomed this spring, but now there are no leaves on it. Can I save it? Or should I cut it down? What do y'all think? It could be boards in there, could it might. Yeah, I would look at the I look Base. at the bark, look at the trunk of that tree, and see if you see any gum, uh, sap yeah. coming out. out. Mm -hmm. But because probably uh, if you've got a if you have a peach plum or a nectarine in yeah. this area, you're going to get peach tree bores if you mm -hmm. don't go with a preventative insecticide spray. And you've got to be pretty lucky to hit that yeah. uh, as that adult moth is, is flying around laying eggs. Uh, the peach tree borer is devastating. It's a devastating insect. They get in the, the, uh, the trunk of the trees and disrupts the, you know, the cambium layer mm -hmm. and, and, and it causes them to throw their leaves off. It causes them to die. It'll kill the tree. But peaches, plums, and nectarines, both the ornamental types and the fruit bearing types, are, are susceptible to that. That's why I don't have any in my landscape. Yeah, you're exactly right. And purple leaf plums have problems with mm -hmm. boars. boars. They're short-lived trees, you know, as it mm -hmm. is. Yeah. But then you get these boars in there and they will actually disrupt 
you know, the, the movement of water and nutrients, right. you know, uh, throughout the plant. So there you have it. Go ahead, yeah, I had one in my yard too, man. The same thing attacked it. Boards got in. Mm -hmm. And in an over a period of time, all the leaves were gone. Mm. So it, it will do that to that tree. If you, this time of the year, if you don't have any leaves on your purple leaf plum, I'd say take it out. Cut that. <laughs> one cut. One huh? pruning one cut. One pruning cut. It's <laughs> called ground. severe, severe pruning. Prune. <laughs> you know, take it down to the ground. That's the best thing to do for it. Yep. Right at the bottom. Yeah, don't right. even worry about it. So there you go. I hope it helps you out, Miss Teresa. All right, here's our next question. Next viewer email. I am having a problem with large earthworms in my garage and on my driveway. What can I do? I need help. I have a lawn service and they treat it with grub spray. No improvement. Any suggestions, ideas would be greatly appreciated. Thanks for your help, Miss Esther. Oh, don't know if I'll be trying to get rid of those earthworms, Mr. D. So, you know, you know, you know you think? You, if you've got earthworms, that indicates that you've got a uh, healthy Good soil. soil. I think so. Uh, you've got organic matter. And I understand why the grub worm insecticide didn't kill the earthworms because Grub worms aren't earthworms. That's right. Earthworms aren't grub worms. Grub worms feed on, you know, plant material and, and, and roots and things like that. And you know, but the earthworms they're feeding on organic matter and and I don't. What, what do the earthworms feed on? They're they feel they they they're just a hollow tube. I don't. I guess know. we are too. In a way, you're a hollow yeah, tube. We take yeah. stuff in and it goes out. But uh, uh, they don't feed a on lot the of same plant, things. You know, plant matter. They don't feed on the same right. things. Uh, but that indi they, you know, they aerate your lawn, they add organic matter to your, or they aerate your soil, they add mm -hmm. organic matter to your soil. It, they're just an indicator of a healthy ecosystem in your soil. And I would not try to be getting rid of them. I know that it's irritating mm -hmm. you know, when you step on one and you're barefooted and you're, <laughs> as you're stepping out of your garage. But, you know, keep you a broom handy and just kind of sweep them out of the way. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I wouldn't try to get rid of them. I put them back in the line, you know, especially now it's so yeah. hot going across the concrete. They you know, help them out, put them back in the line. <laughs> catch them and take a kid fishing. Ah, yeah, yeah. Bait night. Brim. Bait. Love them. Yeah, they're great bait, bait. you know. You wanna, you, if you've got that many, you don't even have to dig dig bait. for them. You can sell That's fish right. bait, you know. Yeah. Just yeah, pick you them up off the ground. Think, you, see them at, you see them at a rain, you have a heavy rain, you right. see them there come out of the ground. Come, I see them all the time on, on my side, walking everything. Like I said, I try to put them back in there. I don't want to just kill them because they're, really, they're doing some good in your soil. They're really keeping the air rate of some, too, because right. they're moving through the soil. So try not to kill them. Yeah. <laughs> Earthworms, I call them little tillers. So yeah, they're tillers. They're friends going, in the friend. garden. They're your beneficials. Yeah, they're going through the garden, having a good time. Yeah, and they produce that black gold, which oh. is earthworm casting, which you okay. can uh, you know, use in your flower beds and things like that. So I would not try to get rid of my earthworms. earthworms. Mm -hmm. I definitely would not do that, Ms. Esther. So I hope, hope that helps you out. All right, here's our next question. My banana pepper plant has brown and black spots all over the leaves. What is causing that? And again, this is the banana pepper plant. Brown and black spots on the leaves, specifically. Mm. Right, the only thing that I saw that matches that description is the bacterial spot. Uh, okay, that's what uh, I think as well. Kinda, I kind of looked down through the diseases uh, in the Red Book right. uh, again. And uh, fixed copper mixed with mancozeb. Uh, mm. So copper-based fungicide? A copper-based fungicide should give you some relief. Uh, I do notice that some varieties of uh, peppers are resistant to bacterial spot, and you might want to check that out. And hopefully, I don't know how many peppers you, you said. Banana, one, is it one banana Yeah, pepper? we don't know how many. Uh, you know, you might want to check next time, or, or it's not too late to plant a banana pepper now try to find one that has some resistance to bacterial spot. Right. Resistant and varieties are always out there. Resistant yeah. variety, that, that's better than having to spray all the time. Right. Um, if you've got that problem, also this, this is some cultural yeah. practices. Uh -huh. uh, do not mess, don't pick your peppers or uh, mess with them while they're wet mm -hmm. because you can spread, it's a, you know bacterial, so you can spread it. And um, that's, that's a, just one little thing that you, you might want to okay. kind of catch. Yeah, in the thing, you know, uh, pepper and tomato get the same disease. Mm -hmm. Rotate the, rotate the, that's right. Rotate in the garden. That's one of the good things. Don't, mm -hmm. don't plant them where you had your tomato. Put them somewhere else in your garden next year because the, the disease you put else in, might not get on that plant. So I rotate them it's probably about next three years before I come to that same spot again. Okay. And move them around in, in, your, in, your, in your vegetable garden. Okay. Rotation, mm -hmm. crop rotation, crop rotation, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, resistant varieties. Resistant varieties. Yeah, good. And cultural practices. I think you should always mulch yep. you know, around your vegetables too. So mm -hmm. uh, cut down on the splashing effect. Mm -hmm. All right.
Uh, Mr. D, Booker, we're out of time. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Good. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us a letter or an email with your gardening questions. Send your email to familyplot at wkno.org. The mailing address is Family Plot, 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next time for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.